filling up. What is? There's about 40 people thus far, which makes me happy. For nice. the showing of our, our, our we're going to today. That's good. I wanted, that's about what we had, wasn't it? Yeah. It, had it about sucks 40 that people. IMAX was only one day, though. I know, really. Like, they literally just like, ah, you get one screen for I one know, day of IMAX. I know, it really does suck, because you know what they put in? The movie that's been out now for three or four weeks now. They put the Batman back in IMAX. Yeah. It's like... They just have... They just... They don't know yet. They don't know that people would go see it. Like, but they're missing out on money, because I guarantee they're going to get more tickets and butts. Ab- Absolutely, they, they screwed the pooch on that one. Because uh, those seats right here that we're going to go see this in, these would have, I'm sure half of them would have chosen IMAX. I would have. Yeah, me yep. too. But still, it'll be great. Yeah. Just. Hey, welcome back to our stupid Rex Eats of Corbin. I'm Rick. And you can follow us on Instagram, Instagram Twitter, 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 no, no, I, I, I've auditioned for quite a few, but uh, I've not got anything. I know you've done a couple, right? I have. I've done a couple. It's, I mean, it's, just, it's a great... But great I thought it'd be really cool to actually uh, sit and listen to him oh talk. Oh, goodness, yes. Uh, so here we go. Okay, prediction. Is he going to have a cigarette? Not in America, no. I think oh, he's 78. Gonna, he's going to be smoking. He's going to be smoking. 78, maybe, yeah. Different time. So he was here at AFI. I wonder who was there. And the man himself. Well, in the 40s, I an saw uh, the American films of Jean Renoir. The first one was The Southerner, and then eventually I saw Diary of a Chambermaid and a few other things. And then uh, I had read about his French work and. Uh, I was familiar with his father's paintings. And no, then Renoir, British accent. in 49, mm-hmm. I British? think he came to no. Uh, no, but it's, uh, Calcutta it's definitely to affected. look for locations for the He was probably event. there when the British were, obviously. Uh, I was an advertising man at that time, and it so happened that my, the agency where I worked was quite near the hotel where he was staying. So I just went and presented myself as, as, a, as a student of the cinema. And uh, I got to know him quite well because he was comparatively free at that time in the evenings and uh, I would often sort of drop in. And later in 1950, well, he came, I went back to Hollywood and then came back again in, in the 50s to start shooting. But I, I'm afraid I was not in a position to watch him work because I had my job. I went on a Sunday or maybe a couple of Sundays to watch him. And then I left for England. And it was in England that I first saw Renoir's French films. Uh, La Règle de Jeu and uh, Pâté du Campagne and all the rest of them. And uh, even before I had seen them, I had uh, seen them, I had discussed them with him, I had put questions to him about his various films, La Bête Humaine. And so that was uh, very, very uh, important for me. The talks that I had with him, even before I had seen his French films, that was very, very important. There's one social uh, comment that you make in all the films that I've seen that you've done, and I'm wondering if it has any effect on the Indian people and what kind of effect, if it does. And that is the, the vision of the wife, a woman, as servant. Is anything happening in India right now as far as that cultural tradition? Well, obviously a lot has happened. There's a tremendous lot of emancipation, and part of that is uh, the theme of Mahanagar, the big city, which is my middle 60s film. The film deals entirely with that aspect. A wife who would normally be just a housewife uh, suddenly is faced with a situation where she has to go out and find a job to support uh, her husband's income because they are not earning. I mean, they have to, you know, just just make both ends meet. And she gets a job as a sales girl. The in-laws are terribly upset that their daughter-in-law should go out and, you know, do that. But she becomes a success in her work and start, begins to earn more than the husband. And there's the psychological conflict between the two. And finally, the husband loses his job, etc. I mean, it's, it's that kind of thing, which is, which is very much the kind of thing that you're right. 
do you think the big city was very instrumental in promoting this kind of change? I don't think a film uh, does that really. As a matter of fact, uh, I must refer to a re remark. Remark. Gerd Renoir was asked the same question: you know, how, how much do you think? What kind of influence do you think has a film or has on society? And he mentioned the instance, instance of La Grande Illusion, which was made one year before the Second World uh, War started. It was an anti-war statement, very powerful, but it didn't prevent the war. <laughs> <laughs> How carefully do you pre-plan your film before you're going to make it, or your films? When you illustrate them very, very accurately? Or? Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's been my practice right from the... Well, the first film had no proper script because I... The film was made while I still had my advertising job. And it was all in my head. Uh, it, it was shot on weekends, frankly speaking, over a period of two years. Like Tarantino. Two years because for long stretches we had no money. Yes. That's why Just it was like so long. Tarantino, and in yeah. fact, the film was shelved several times and everybody was told that, no, that's, that's all. We can't... Uh, this. But later on, uh, I had to be very economical, and if you want to be yeah. economical, uh, you have to be disciplined. You have to pre-plan to a considerable extent, and so everything is very carefully planned in my films. My shooting ratio, incidentally, is four to one. It's been that all the way through. Uh, I rarely exceed it. And, um, well, there is room left for improvisation, particularly if you're shooting on location. Uh, you get ideas, um, a certain uh, change of climate, you know, you have this, uh, some wind rises or clouds come and you have to do new things which are not in the script and you find new camera angles all the time. Uh, but shooting in the studio, confined within the three or four walls of the set, you have to be very, very careful. And in any case, uh, I, we couldn't uh, afford to be wasteful in the circumstances which we were. I operate my own camera now. I've been doing so for the last 15 years. Not that I have no trust in my cameraman's operational abilities, but uh, I feel that uh, ever since we've been using an iReflex, that is the best position to judge the, the acting from, is through the lens. And also, I notice that working with non-professionals, they are happier if they don't see my face. While I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Which is often my directors not sort are of often staring in the at them like yeah. that. And, you know, true. Uh, so they are happier. They feel more relaxed. And I enjoy operation, but I have a lighting cameraman. And of course, nothing. We, 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 it's all done through discussions. And uh, now I'm using a second cameraman. I started with one cameraman, Shubroto Mitro who was a beginner at that time. He was 21 when he shot the first film. Never handled a movie camera in his life. Uh, but I had to have a new camera because all the professionals said that you can't shoot in rain and you can't shoot out of doors. The light keeps changing. The sun goes down too fast, etc. So I had to have a new cameraman and we decided on certain basic things. Who doesn't know you can't do it that way? We were great admirers. Both of us were great admirers of Cartier Bresson and we believed in available light. And we aimed at simulating available light in the studio by using bounce lights. And this is interesting because, well, this, uh, this had, didn't happen with the first film, but with the second film, when we had to shoot interiors in the studio, supposedly houses in Benares, uh, where there was a central courtyard with no roof on top, and the light all came from the sky, and it was a kind of top top lighting, shadowless, that we started uh, using uh, bounce lighting with cloth stretched over the, over and the lights bounced back from those. And we had also had boards, framed white pieces of white cloth, large enormous things, and bounced back from that. Except for night scenes where there is a source of light established and you, you follow that source as much as possible. If it's candle, if it's lantern, if it's electric light, you follow the source. It simplifies things, you know. And uh, later, well, I think about seven or eight years after that, I read an article in the American Cinematographer by, written by Sven Nyquist, saying this was at the time of Through a Glass Darkly, I think, that they had invented 
bounce like <laughs> as far as what we've been doing it since ever since night and since 1953 what a shock. before so that's uh America there's never a great the cameraman and myself but i compose my images and i operate them there's a focus puller of course and there's a lighting cameraman and everything is decided beforehand with a color film all the color schemes every piece of costume i go out myself to buy the material and uh, my scripts are all in visual <laughs> forms. They're not sort of written documents which can be duplicated and handed out to the various members of the crew. They're, they're just just little sketches, frame sketches with directions down on the right-hand side and little notes on dialogue and camera movements. Because I don't think it's a literary medium anyway. Why waste words? Why try? It? Because uh, if it's only when the question of publication comes that you have to uh, devise a kind of part novel, Great part point. drama Great form. Point. How has censorship affected your films? Not to any serious extent. There was, uh, <clears throat> because I have more or less been oblique in my statements, even on, on human relationship. Um, we can't afford to be too permissive, you know. In any case, we know we cannot, and I, I have, I'm not particularly anxious to be too permissive, because I think that one, there has to be some room left for suggestion and uh, obliqueness and but there is, uh, I believe, a strong political censorship. There is a censorship of violence. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of fighting in the new commercial cinema, but there's no blood shown. Apparently, you're free. You're, you're free to show a lot of uh, bashing of art, but, but if you show ketchup, then you're in for it. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the um, current favorites in India right now from American films? Current, not history well godfather had a tremendous success i'm sure star wars is going to be a tremendous success jaws will be a tremendous exorcist is playing in calcutta now for the last three months when i left wonder when this was released well it's the same as yeah it's a, it's this is 1970 i know i want to know I wanna rubber stamp reaction we'll talk about jaws after to those films uh, the present uh, board of censors seems to be very lenient as far as foreign films go. We've had one flew over the cuckoo's nest, which uh, was shown with very few cuts. I saw it in, in, in somewhere abroad, and then I saw it in Calcutta again. I noticed very, very few cuts. So the present uh, group of censors, it always depends on the individuals who comprise the board. And if they are sensible people, with some understanding of film art, they will be lenient when they see uh, an important work of art. No, uh, I was just thinking I could listen to him for three hours and there it goes, it ends. Yeah, I wonder if there's more. Uh, there's only a, a little 11 minute clip, but it went by. There's it. gotta be a full. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I what? Was listen to this that one. was magic. Yeah, that was, uh, you could listen to great artists, although we could talk about it all the time. But especially to somebody who I, I never thought we'd actually be able to get an interview, especially in English. That's the clearest, <clears throat> longest anything I've ever seen of Sachi Jit Rai. Mm -hmm. And the most in-depth on the okay. actual process. It's, it's process and it, it... The reason I was saying what it was about Jaws is 78 was when it came out. I think it was either 77 or 78. Jaws? Yeah, but I wonder if, if he <clears throat> saw it like early, pre-release, before it became popular. Um which I doubt because before Jaws came out, word on the street in the industry was this is an absolute disaster because mm -hmm. Spielberg had problems with his mechanical shark. He went over budget. Dreyfus and uh, Shaw were fighting all the time and it was predictions where it was going to be terrible. Well, and then it became one of the first blockbusters. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very interesting. I'd love to know when he saw it. And if you're not familiar with some of the terms, look them up. Some of them are outdated. Bounce lighting's not outdated. They still do bounce lighting all the time. Um, and it, you, it, it's, you, you, you have to, especially if you're doing, they do it all the time when you're doing an interior. Um, and sometimes it isn't a direct bounce. Sometimes it's just a filter. But you have to create the outdoor light if you're doing a... Uh, for example, a house as an interior, which is very common, you need the light outside. It's and it's crazy sometimes when you're this on a set. Not, this is not natural light. You, by the way, it is weird if you're on set. Sometimes, like we, were, I was doing this thing where we were on a train all day, mm -hmm. and it was just green screen, but the lighting was natural light, so it 
felt like a really nice sunny day all day, but it was gray and stormy outside. So anytime you went outside, you had that cool disconnect because time stands still in a sound stage. You're in the time that's created. And when you go out back outside, you're like, whoa, that was trippy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, man, I could listen to him talk all day. Yeah, uh, I wonder if there's a longer one. I don't, I didn't see it anywhere. This is the only one I saw. If there is, you can let us know because yeah, I could listen to him talk all day. It's also so interesting uh, the, the time that this was put out. So obviously, uh, the audience is asking different questions. The public perception of film is different yeah. at that time than it obviously is now. And, and the advancements technologically, yeah. obviously. But um, he's very much. I'm. He, it wouldn't surprise me if he liked the films of Orson Welles because he's very much like Orson Welles. Orson Welles was asked about making movies and why he was so successful with his first few films. And he said, because I didn't know what I could fail at. I, I, you, and you don't, you just start, you just do it. I didn't know how to write a screenplay. I didn't know how to use a camera. I just wanted to do it. And his choice of a cinematographer who's gonna do something because all the other ones said, well, you can't do that. It's like, well, I'll go get somebody who'll do it because they don't know what they can't do. And mm -hmm. great, great encouragement for me because one of the reasons I've tried to turn Barbarian into a screenplay mm -hmm. and formatting it's insane. I need to go back into it and stop thinking format and just let it be. Yeah. Because you really don't need, it's not a literary form. Yeah. You don't need your screenplay to be in a particular format. It's not a published work. Yeah. And he also seems like, and I, that, I think that's actually most directors, I feel like if you're a director who's not a control freak, or yeah. a perfectionist, I, I, I feel like there's very few who aren't control freaks. As directors. Yeah. It just yeah. comes with the territory. And if, and if you're not in control, you have someone you trust implicitly and you'll use them every time. Example, directors may not be so um, <laughs> into it that they're going to go literally choose the costume material, but I guarantee their costumer is going to be somebody that they trust implicitly as if they were doing it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's why you see a lot of directors do a bunch of different things. Vishal doing composing and directing and, and, and writing. And you see, we talk about this all the time. There's a reason people work with the same people over and over again. Yeah. They trust and know that they're going to get what they want done. Yeah, most direct, direct, directors, obviously actors have stereotypes. Every every position has stereotypes. Right. Directors, it's, uh, they're very, I don't, I don't know what that is. Is it type A? There's yeah, just, type A dictatorial typically. Yeah, like they're just, I have, I have some of that in me. Very much so. Uh, I trust very few people to do anything, uh, especially when it comes to like if, if it's something I'm working on, I just... Yeah, because you have to have a clear vision mm -hmm. and you have to be able to tell everybody this is what I want. And it's hard to express that. Yeah. And sometimes you just got to say, like, because that's what I want to have done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just... You have, and you, you can't... If you don't have a clear vision and you're just there, it's, but it's a strange monster because you also have to be collaborative. Yeah. It's a very strange monster. It's not definitively type A and dictatorial. It's funny. Uh, when we did the million video, um, I didn't direct that. I, I had a, a, what a, great a, team. a, a friend of mine who, um, I, it's not really, we've worked together a few times. Um, and he did a great job. I loved him. Uh, and the whole team he brought on was great team. fantastic. Everybody. But it was also a struggle for me because he, he wanted to do stuff, especially when we got to the editing part of it, that I, I was like, I, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> And that's where the producer has final say, kids. Because that's true in the industry as well. Because obviously, The producer can't tell the director no. Because obviously I had a specific vision of what I wanted the video Correct. to look like. And Correct. he certain shots as a director he liked more. But I, I saw visually I was like, yeah. that's not that's not what we need. And, <laughs> and Which so, is why a lot of directors produce. Yeah. Because they want to have the final say. Because the person who's paying the bills can say, no, 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 no. This is my investment. I want a return on investment. So yeah, it's a big collaborative effort. That's why yeah. geniuses are, are are so fun to what a gift uh, that is fun to listen to. So if there's more yeah, of this video, please, please let us know if there's more of this video. I'd love to watch it uh, in its entirety. So please let us know down below. Oh, which be our next such a dry film? Uh, we're due for one. We are due. Uh, last one was. Uh, in, did we watch one in Classic Month? We did not watch his? one this past Classic Month. No. No, we did. No, we didn't. No, we did. No, we didn't. What we was did. it? We watched a Bengali film. We watched a Bengali film, but it what wasn't was it? Sachi Jirai. What was it? Um, um, oh, I feel like it was him. I don't believe it was. Hold on. Oh, look. I feel like our last Sachi Jirai was Big City. Mm -mm. Sorry, I'm looking. So Sabdu was our last Bobby C. Bengali. The Stranger. 
Told you. Yeah, it was The Stranger in... Uh, oh, crap. You're absolutely right. Month. You're yeah. absolutely right. It I was we did. early, like yeah. the, one of the very first ones yeah, we watched that month. Yeah. Yep, you're right. It's been, it's been a long year so far. Yep. Anyways, let us know what the next such ride film should be down below. Just